When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. May our testimonies be as deep and as strong as that of Jacob, who, when confronted by one who sought to destroy his faith, declared, I could not be shaken. Hello, my friends. Welcome back to Unshaken. I'm Jared Halverson, and I'm thrilled to have you back for some more time in the Book of Mormon. This week, we're going to be studying Ether chapter 6 through 11. And if you've ever sat down and plowed through 1st and 2nd Kings and or 1st and 2nd Chronicles, you're going to kind of have a sense of some of the material we're going to be plowing through today. What you see in those Old Testament books is king after king, often switching back and forth between a king of Judah and a king of Israel. Some good, most bad, but massive amounts of history with insights being brought out by various kings to see what we should or shouldn't do, whether we should follow their example or not. We'll see the same kinds of things today as we go through a massive amount of Jaredite history. Father to son, sometimes brother and nephew and so on, but lots and lots of kings, some good, some bad with lessons to learn from many of them. And don't worry, there's no quiz at the end of today's session where you have to match the name of a Jaredite king with the events that took place in his reign. I don't think there's angels passing out scantrons and number two pencils on Judgment Day to see if we can regurgitate scriptural trivia. What's most important is that we learn some lessons on how to live our lives, the kinds of sins that must be avoided, and the kinds of solutions that the Lord offers to help us navigate that territory. But before we get into it, I want to tell you a little something about the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Now, I grew up in California, and so I'll always be partial to parks like Yosemite or Kings Canyon, Sequoia, the Redwoods. And now that I live in Utah, I've fallen in love with places like Arches and Zion National Park. But when we lived in Tennessee, and I found out that the Great Smoky Mountains National Park was the most visited national park in the United States, I thought, I've got to check that place out. So my wife and I gathered up the kids and we made a trip to East Tennessee to see the Smoky Mountains. They are breathtaking. Well worth the trip. But the irony of that trip is that we learned a kind of parable along the way. Because just outside Smoky Mountains National Park, almost kind of this gateway community as you enter the park, is a place called Gatlinburg, Tennessee. Really cool place. It's kind of a resort town. The only ski resort in Tennessee is there. There's shopping, kind of upscale restaurants and things, art galleries. Feels a little like Park City, if you're more familiar with Utah. So there's the first thing to keep in mind for this parable. The destination that people are coming from all over the country to see is the Great Smoky Mountains. But just outside is a resort town called Gatlinburg. Well, just outside Gatlinburg is another town. Calling it a resort town would be speaking too highly of it. It's called Pigeon Forge. And the closest thing I can compare it to, if you've ever seen the old Disney movie Pinocchio, it's Pleasure Island, where all these unsuspecting little boys are carried off to revel in their hedonism, give in to their natural man, and eventually turn into donkeys along the way. Pigeon Forge is full of go-kart places and arcades and miniature golf. Dollywood, an amusement park, is there. And as we pass through Pigeon Forge and then through Gatlinburg on the way to the Great Smoky Mountains, my wife and I realized, whoa, we just went from telestial to terrestrial to celestial. And we wondered how many people intent on seeing the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. I wonder how many of them stopped short and used up all their money in Gatlinburg. Or even worse, wasted it all in riotous living, to borrow from the parable of the prodigal son, back in Pigeon Forge. And true to that parable, how many of us come to earth intent on completing the journey back to the celestial kingdom, returning home to our Father in heaven, and yet get sidetracked, either in celestial transgressions or terrestrial diversions, and never end up getting to the place we'd driven cross-country to see? Now, I'm far from being the first to ask those kinds of questions or draw those kinds of parallels. For the last 300 years or so, one of the most popular books among the reading Christian public is called Pilgrim's Progress. It was written by John Bunyan near the end of the 17th century. If you were a Christian in the 1700s, 1800s, 1900s, especially if you were a Puritan, and you only owned one book, it would always be the Bible. But if you owned two, your second volume was typically Pilgrim's Progress. 
and it tells this allegory of the Christian journey back to God. The main character's name is Christian. Bunyan wasn't exactly trying to hide his, his message here. And he goes on this journey to get back to the celestial city. But one of the interesting places he passes through on the way is called Vanity Fair. Now that title should ring some bells for us in our day. There's a magazine called Vanity Fair. There's a clothing store called Vanity Fair. Yes, there's even a Vanity Fair outlet in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. And it's shocking that companies in our day have labeled themselves Vanity Fair because John Bunyan did not mean anything positive when he invented that term. You see, a fair is the kind of place you go to have fun, right? To waste your money, to fill your belly, whatever it might be. Pigeon Forge is such a perfect example of it. But in Pilgrim's Progress, it's this city that lies right on the path, the straight and narrow that leads you to the celestial city. It gets in your way. He says, I saw in my dream that when they were got out of the wilderness, they presently saw a town before them, and the name of that town is Vanity. And at the town, there is a fair kept called Vanity Fair. It is kept all the year long. So on your journey to the celestial city, there's no avoiding Vanity Fair. If you're headed to the Smoky Mountains, at least from the north, you cannot avoid Pigeon Forge along the way. But in this journey that Christian is taking, he realizes there's some decisions to make on what to avoid as he passes through Vanity Fair. Now, as I said, the way to the celestial city lies just through this town where this lusty fair is kept. And he that will go to the city and yet not be through this town must needs go out of the world. Again, there's no way to avoid it. The prince of princes himself, he's speaking of Jesus now, when here went through this town to his own country and that upon a fair day too. Yea, and as I think it was Beelzebub, the chief lord of this fair, that invited him to buy of his vanities, yea, would have made him lord of the fair, would he but have done him reverence as he went through the town. Yea, because he was such a person of honor, Beelzebub had him from street to street, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a little time, that he might, if possible, allure that blessed one to cheapen and buy some of his vanities. But he had no mind to the merchandise, and therefore left the town without laying out so much as one farthing upon these vanities. This fair, therefore, is an ancient thing of long standing and a very great fair. Now, a lot happens to Christian, our pilgrim, as he passes through Vanity Fair and tries to escape it. One of his traveling companions is martyred there, and yet he finds another one with whom to escape from these vanities. It's a fascinating book especially since we're living it here in the 21st century, not just among those Puritan readers that read it before. That is the challenge of consumerism and commercialism, of hedonism and materialism, of worldliness. How do we make it through Vanity Fair and actually get to the celestial city? How do we navigate that road that goes right through Pigeon Forge, literally, and then through Gatlinburg before it finally gets you to your ultimate destination, one of the most beautiful spots on earth? As we study the book of Ether today, how did these Jaredites navigate their voyage, not just to the literal promised land, but to the spiritual one that they sought even after they reached the shore? Because so much of what we'll read today are the negatives that take place at Vanity Fair, thirsting after power and pleasure and prosperity, lust, ambition, greed. These are all the kinds of things that the Jaredites will have to confront and choose either to succumb to them or overcome them with their faith in better things. In the United States of Joseph Smith's day, every early reader of the Book of Mormon was being confronted with those decisions on a daily basis. It was amazing that in early America, European visitors that came to the United States during the 1800s were shocked at how materialistic everyone seemed to be. One visitor said, they look like a race that are selling their lives for gold. Another said, every bee in the hive is actively employed in search of that honey, vulgarly called money. Neither art, science, learning, nor pleasure can seduce them from its pursuit. Alexis de Tocqueville, that famous French observer of America, said, I'm not even aware of a country where the love of money has a larger place in men's hearts. And another observer said that money is the deity to whom all pay adoration. Herman Melville, another famous author from the 19th century, 
And Moby Dick said this, noting how insane it was for people to work so hard to obtain money when they knew that the love of money was the root of all evil. He said, ah, how cheerfully we consign ourselves to perdition. And a 19th century American Protestant minister, Henry Ward Beecher, called consumerism the pursuit of incarnated lies. He said, we that consume are daily in the consumption of lies. We drink lying coffee. We eat lying bread. We patch lying clothes with cheating thread. We perfume ourselves with lying essence. We wet our feet in lying boots. Catch cold, however, truly enough, and are tormented with adulterated drugs. Such an interesting thing to consider. Are we spending our livelihoods on lying things? Products and pursuits that deceive us into thinking they will bring true happiness when they can't. As we watch the steady decline of Jaredite civilization during these chapters, today we will go from the very beginning with Jared and his brother to the very end with Ether. Next week we'll see Ether's ministry unfold, but he's the last person we'll meet today. And the road that we will follow is the road through Vanity Fair. It's pigeon forged today. And people falling into revolt and rebellion to secret combinations, which will occupy a lot of our attention today, all in pursuit of the same three great temptations that Jesus himself completely ignored in the wilderness as he walked the straight and narrow path through Vanity Fair with blinders on. Ignoring the lusts of the flesh, those physical appetites that are satisfied, or so we think, with the sins and sensuality that the adversary bombards us with everywhere we look. The casting himself from the temple to satisfy the sin of pride, to show people how important he was and the power that he had. And then the third temptation, to worship Satan in return for all the kingdoms of the world. Materialism and worldliness there. We have seen this so many times throughout the Book of Mormon. The great and spacious building, the great and abominable church, the wicked Nephites of Jacob's day, King Noah and his people, the people of Ammonihah, the downfall of Nephite civilization in 4th Nephi and Mormon, as we saw in the previous few weeks. And we will see them over and over again today in what we study in the Book of Ether. So keep your eye out for it. The Jaredite civilization never makes it to the celestial city they get caught up in Vanity Fair along the way. But chapter 6 begins with a literal voyage toward the Promised Land. If you remember last week, chapter 4 and chapter 5 were an interruption of the narrative so that Moroni could talk about the record of the brother of Jared that would eventually come forth and then give some items of instruction to Joseph Smith and the three witnesses of the record that he was producing. If you were to remove 4 and 5 and just read straight from Ether 3 to Ether 6, the story would just progress without a blip. Moroni gives us that sense as he begins. Chapter 6, verse 1. Now I, Moroni, proceed to give the record of Jared and his brother. So we're back where we left off. For it came to pass, after the Lord had prepared the stones which the brother of Jared had carried up into the mount, the brother of Jared came down out of the mount, and he did put forth the stones into the vessels which were prepared, one in each end thereof, and behold, they did give light unto the vessels. To me, it's interesting the word that was used there in verse 2. The Lord prepared the stones. He prepared them. What exactly does that mean? Preparation seems to suggest something happening before the actual event. Were they shining when the brother Jared brought them down the mountain? Honestly, I don't know. In fact, we completely lose sight of the stones the moment we see the finger part of the veil back in chapter 3. At least that was the case for the brother Jared and for Moroni who is recording these things or abridging them. Back in chapter 3, it says, where are we, verse 6, that the Lord stretched forth his finger and touched the stones one by one with his finger. But the moment he says that, we're not even worried about the stones anymore. The brother of Jared is fixated on that finger. And then he has this incredible experience as the veil parts completely. And he sees the Lord. Then he sees all things. Are the stones already glowing? Do they begin to illuminate the moment the Lord touches them with his finger? The text actually doesn't say. All we know by the time we get on with the story in chapter 6 is that the Lord, having touched them, had prepared the stones. We know that they give light unto the vessels, but were they already illuminated on the trip down the mountain? No clue. Or was this a matter of faith for the brother of Jared to continue exercising? 
Do we sometimes falter in our faith between promise and fulfillment? Or do we trust the Lord's promises? He touched them. I'm sure they will shine when they need to. And so they did. In verse 3, the Lord caused stones to shine in darkness, to give light unto men, women, and children, that they might not cross the great waters in darkness. Now, these stones are literal in this story, but they could represent so many different things. Like I talked about last week, about this first family home evening lesson my wife and I had. As we were trying to create a home that was tight like unto a dish, that could keep the worldly sin and influence out of it, we began to see ourselves as these stones. Mere rocks, that's all we felt like, especially once the children began to join the family. Do we have any idea what we're doing? We didn't feel like we did. But knowing that if the Lord could touch us with his spirit, could point with his finger the direction that we should go, then the two of us, a couple of rocks with no experience in this all-important task, could still shine. I love that two stones were placed within each vessel, one at each end, to provide light to all that were inside. Now, as we make our mortal voyage towards the celestial promised land, not every barge has two shining stones within them. World War II destroyed my grandpa, and when he came home, he thought it would be better for the family to just leave them. And he divorced my grandma and left her to raise my mom and my aunt and my uncle by herself. That barge, which they did everything they could to keep tight like unto a dish, only had one stone inside, but it was a brilliant one, enough to light the way for that sweet family along their journey. So whether your barge has one stone or two, they can shine if we allow the Lord to touch them, to touch us and give us his light. Now, if we allow these stones to stand as a metaphor, parents is only one possible interpretation. There are so many things that are mere rocks but the moment the Lord touches them, they can give us sight. And in fact, considering this is a miracle from start to finish, the rocks themselves weren't even necessary. If the Lord can miraculously make stones shine, couldn't he just make the wood inside brilliant? Couldn't he devise some other way so that the barges could be illuminated from within? Why do we need rocks to begin with? Remember, it was the brother of Jared's idea. And in some ways, this was the best I can come up with. I can't imagine light being able to come in any other way. So would you touch these stones? We know that you can make them shine. It's amazing how often the Lord is willing to give us training wheels, for lack of a better word, to help us focus our faith in something tangible when we can't see him. The Ten Commandments, the law of God, were stones that God touched with his finger. And the light of justice, of truth, of righteousness, shone through them to the people of Israel. So mere tablets of stone, if you're Moses, mere plates of metal, if you're Nephi, mere clay and spittle, if you're the blind man and Jesus anoints your eyes and tells you to wash in the pool of Siloam. He didn't need to do any of that. But for the blind man's sake, wanting him to sense, to feel that something was happening to him, I've often asked my students, which of those elements actually gave sight to the blind? Was it the clay? Was it the spit? Was it the water from Siloam? Correct answer, none of the above. It was the power of God. But thankfully, recognizing our weakness, the Lord often gives us something physical, something tangible to help us focus our faith. The staff of Moses, the liahona, the brazen serpent, the seer stone, that Joseph used to translate the Book of Mormon, consecrated oil that we use in priesthood blessings, bread and water in the sacrament, the temple garment, even more worldly things like a wedding ring or a tassel and mortar board on graduation. We have these rites of passage. We have these tangible objects that help us recognize that something is happening or has happened to us, an outer object that marks an inner reality. If they are mere training wheels, I am grateful the Lord puts them on my bike because I'm not very good at balance yet. Call them crutches to faith? Fine. There are times my faith needs those kinds of crutches. Scoff at seer stones if you choose. But I am grateful that the Lord touches stones to allow us to see things we otherwise wouldn't. And sometimes, 
the rock he chooses to illuminate is you or me. Those kinds of blessings are intended for everyone. As he says in the middle of verse 3, they gave light to men, to women, to children, because everyone could benefit. And as he says at the end of the verse, how did they benefit? They did not cross the great waters in darkness. Now they could have. The brother of Jared admitted earlier that he was willing to submit to that reality if it was the will of God, but he hoped that it wasn't. And the merciful Lord blessed him beyond the bare minimum. You will have light along the way. That light will give you confidence. It will reassure you. It will protect you and increase your safety. It will allow you to more fully connect with one another within the darkness of the deep. There's actually a beautiful phrase in Ezra chapter 9 verse 8 where he prays in gratitude, Now for a little space grace hath been showed from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape, to give us a nail in his holy place that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. You sense that's all that Ezra is asking for, but so grateful that the Lord would give it in his generosity. Just some grace within this little space that we've been granted. A remnant to escape, even if we don't all escape together. Just a nail, just something to hang our hopes on in that holy place. A blessing that God would lighten their eyes and give them a little reviving in their bondage. You want to talk about feeling trapped, claustrophobic in this submarine vessel that they'd made. There is something alarming about being in pitch black. Even when you know you're totally safe, there's just some reviving in our bondage. There's some reassurance in our claustrophobia. There's light for our eyes. And that light God provides us miraculously. Now, in verse 4, they did all they could on their end. They prepared all manner of food that they might, they might subsist upon the water for themselves as well as for their livestock. And then at the end of verse 4, And they set forth into the sea, commending themselves unto the Lord their God. I love how that verse begins and ends. They need to come together. Some of us are really good at doing the first and not very good at doing the last. We think it's all on us. We work as if we were atheists. We prepare every th needful thing. We take the responsibility and make sure that we've covered everything. But never get around to commending ourselves unto the Lord. We never ask for his help. And sometimes, even after all that homework, we never actually launch forth into the sea. Because how confident can I really be in my man-made efforts? Others of us only want to do the end of the verse and don't want to do the beginning. We trust in God. So we commend ourselves unto him, but we haven't really made sure that the barges are seaworthy to start. Remember how the Lord chastised Oliver Cowdery. You took no thought save it was to ask me? Come on, Oliver. You've got some homework to do. You study it out in your mind. You prepare all manner of food. We need to strike that balance to work like atheists and to pray like saints, to pay the price of preparation, but also to commend ourselves unto the Lord recognizing that no amount of homework that we could do on our own will be sufficient. There will always be a leap of faith as we launch out into the water, but that faith can be fortified by the works that we accomplish in advance. Now in verse 5, now that they're in the water, the Lord God caused that there should be a furious wind blow upon the face of the waters. Now, we should have seen that coming, right? We saw that at the end of chapter 2. The winds have gone forth out of my mouth. The rains and the floods have I sent forth. And those winds were furious. This was no easy trip. Yet notice this detail about the wind. It blew towards the promised land. And that always seems to be the case with the kind of redemptive turbulence, as Elder Maxwell called it, that the Lord often sends into our lives. In fact, that's one of the ways you can tell that that turbulence is meant to be redemptive, that the trials came from the Lord instead of just self-inflicted wounds because they move us forward along the path. We talked about that last week, that we come to know God in our extremities. They certainly would. They would have to know that it was by the Lord that they were led. He was preparing them against these things. 
The wind was furious, but it was moving them in the right direction. The early saints faced all kinds of wind, but the wind blew them forward, not back. Adversity helps us achieve some of those purposes of mortality. I've often joked with my students that it would be really hard to become a bodybuilder if you lived in outer space. There's no gravity. There's no weight to push against you that allows you to push against it. And some of that resistance that life provides is exactly what we need to build faith, the muscle that is required of us here. That actually helps explain an interesting statement that President Boyd K. Packer once made, that there is more equality in our trials than we realize, and that sometimes the hardest trial is the apparent absence of any. Wait, wait. The hardest trial is the absence of trial? Well, sign me up for that difficulty. But think about it. If the purpose of life is to help us come to know God, and we come to know Him in our extremities, then imagine a life without the kinds of things that point us to Him. Imagine crossing the ocean with no wind pushing you forward, no wind forming currents to carry you along. To choose to bow before God when circumstances do not bring you to your knees. With an eternal perspective, I hope we can express gratitude for the howling and furious winds, recognizing that they are blowing us towards the promised land, not away from it. Verse 5 ends by admitting that they were tossed upon the waves of the sea before the wind. And 6, it seems like it gets even worse. They were many times buried in the depths of the sea because of the mountain waves which broke upon them and also the great and terrible tempests which were caused by the fierceness of the wind. Yet more redemptive turbulence. Now they'd been warned of that as well. That's why no windows. That's why tight like unto a dish, both on bottom and on top. But what amazes me here is that what seems like the greatest difficulty, being buried in the depths of the sea, was actually a beautiful blessing in disguise. Growing up in Southern California, I loved going to the beach. And raising my own children, landlocked, it's always been fun to take them to the ocean and watch them try to grapple with the waves. It can be a scary thing when you're a little kid and you see a mountain wave about to crash upon you until someone tells you the secret that never would have crossed my mind otherwise. That the answer is not to get above and over that wave, it's to dive beneath it. It's an incredible thing to feel the surf crash above you as you are underneath, safely out of reach of those waves. Once my children began to understand that and to dive under the wave and come up on the other side behind it, once they understood that principle, they were never so scared of the waves. The Lord has so many ways to help us navigate stormy seas. There are times that he's on the boat with us and simply commands, peace, be still. There are other times he helps us walk upon the waters. And there are others where he is willing to descend below all things with us, allowing the mountain waves to crash overhead where we are safely beneath them. In verse 7, they are reassured that when they were buried in the deep, there was no water that could hurt them their vessels being tight like unto a dish, and also they were tight like unto the ark of Noah. We talked about that last week too. Pitched within and without with pitch, or to use the Hebrew more literally, covered within and without with a covering, atoned for. No one can keep the water out of our lives like Jesus can. Therefore, when they were encompassed about by many waters, what did they do? They cried unto the Lord, and he did bring them forth again upon the top of the waters. He's down there with you, descending below all things. Of course, he can lift you up above them. That's what a condescending Christ does. That's the meaning of Jared, to go down. And in verse 8, we see it again. It came to pass that the wind did never cease to blow, but it always blew towards the promised land. No wonder in verse 9, they sing praises unto the Lord. Yea, the brother of Jared did sing praises unto the Lord, and he did thank and praise the Lord all the day long, at times when the hole could be open, and the light of the stones was not quite so necessary, and when the night came, 
and those miraculous stones were the only source of illumination they had. Either way, they did not cease to praise the Lord. I need thee every hour in joy and pain, in daytime and in dark, above the water, beneath the water, everything in between. And in all those hours that I need him, he is there. No wonder we never cease to praise him. At least we shouldn't. Compare this to Laman and Lemuel on their cross-ocean voyage. They were really well behaved for the first little while. I would be too if I was scared to death standing on a ship that my little brother had made with his own hands. Nephi the landlubber growing up in landlocked Jerusalem. I'm really getting on board this thing? Oh boy. Even if I'm layman, I'm praying like I've never prayed before. But once the journey keeps going long enough and it seems to be smooth sailing, and that's all it was, was sailing. I'm never underwater in Nephi's boat. No wonder they got to a point where they were singing, but not singing praises. And life above deck got a little more riotous than reverent. The story is very different for these that were within their barges, often buried in the depths of the sea. Verse 10, Thus they were driven forth, and no monster of the sea could break them, neither whale that could mar them. Of course the whales didn't mar them. They were one of them for all intents and purposes. Remember, that's what the Lord said back in the earlier chapter. You'll be like a whale in the midst of the sea. I even wondered, in spite of the fact these barges were described as light and small, they must have been fairly large to be able to fit these families and their livestock, their provisions, all that they'd used to prepare. I just wonder if these comparisons to whales is more parallel than we realize. Down in the depths, come back up for air. Similar size, perhaps. No wonder the whales could not mar them. They were just as big. If I'm a whale, I don't want to mess with that. And I wonder, do we realize that we are bigger than our problems? Do we realize that as long as the Lord is on board the boat with us, then no monster of the sea can break us, no whale can mar us? With the grace of God, we are bigger than we realize. We're bigger than our problems, bigger than our challenges. We can outlive and outlast them. We can face them with faith. More than survive, we can endure it well and be exalted on high. It's exactly what this group is doing in these vessels. And for 344 days, it says in verse 11, they were driven forth until they reached the promised land. Verse 12, they did land upon the shore of the promised land. And when they had set their feet upon the shores of the promised land, they bowed themselves down upon the face of the land, just like they'd been doing for the previous year on ship. And did humble themselves before the Lord, just like they'd been doing. And did shed tears of joy before the Lord because of the multitude of his tender mercies over them. I testify we will feel that way someday. When we arrive, when we reach the shores of that promised land. Tears of joy, songs of praise, bent knees, humbled hearts, a complete recognition of the multitude of tender mercies that have brought us through. They had light within their vessels, but had no real concept of everything that lay outside them. I don't think we have a clue regarding everything the Lord has saved us from prepared us against, carried us through. Someday we will emerge from our claustrophobic perspective on things, and we will be flooded with the light of realization of just how tender the Lord's mercies have been. And if we will shed tears of joy then, perhaps we can spare a few in advance, recognizing the Lord's hand in our lives. As we'll see in the rest of today's chapters, Every time that their descendants reflected back on this event, it helped ground them again in the gospel. The more they remembered, the more they repented. And the tighter they held on to these stories, the tighter they held the hand of God. Now, as we saw last week, the promised land is only promised if we keep our promises to God. There's work to be done here. The promised land was now their location. But was it their lifestyle yet? We'll see. In verse 13, it came to pass that they went forth upon the face of the land and began to till the earth. There's still work to be done. 
So let's roll up our sleeves and get at it. They have sons and daughters, their numbers multiply, and by verse 17, they are taught to walk humbly before the Lord. And as a result, they were also taught from on high. We were humble on the boats. Can we still be humble on the land? We trusted in God when we knew we needed him. Are we still trusting him now? As we humbly approach the Lord, we will be taught, not just of him, but by him, taught from on high. Now there's a piece of me that wishes that the story ended here, with Jared and his brother and their families having arrived at the promised land, multiplying and waxing strong in the land. But this is just the beginning of Jaredite history. And what we will see unfold from here on out is full of so many difficulties that come when people stopped humbling themselves before the Lord, stopped being taught from on high. This is where they start passing through Vanity Fair. Now what happens to the remainder of chapter 6 of Ether? Jared and his brother are nearing the end of their lives. They know they're about to die. And so they decide, let's gather the people and number them and give them whatever it is that they ask for. Our final blessing. Unfortunately, their desire in verse 22 is that they should anoint one of their sons to be a king over them. Now, for students of Old Testament history, we realize why this is bad news. This should remind us of the story of Samuel, when it's the reign of the judges, and he is a prophet leading the people, and the people finally say, we just want to be like everybody else. We want to have a king so we can be like all the other nations. And Samuel realizes, you're rejecting the king of kings in favor of appointing a mortal leader, and it will lead to your destruction, which it did. The brother of Jared sees the same possibility. Verse 23 says, it was grievous unto them, to both of them, both Jared and his brother. The brother of Jared said unto them, surely this thing leadeth into captivity. But Jared said unto his brother, well, suffer them that they may have a king. And he said unto his people, choose ye out from among our sons a king, even whom ye will. It's interesting that these two brothers seem to be divided in the outcome or their, their final decision they wanted to make, but they both seem to agree in being grieved over their people's desire. You actually get all of this in the Samuel story as well. Samuel is grieved, and so is God, by the people's desire. And it's Samuel that wants to say, absolutely not. This will lead into captivity. Surely it will. And yet what does the Lord say? He allows it to happen. Suffer them that they may have a king. That is such a difficult balance to strike, especially as parents raising a generation that sometimes wants things that we know aren't in their best interest. If we follow the Samuel principle, the Lord says to Samuel, suffer it to be so. Allow them to have their king. Honor their agency, in other words. They're going to exercise it one way or another. But then he adds this interesting phrase in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 9. Now therefore hearken unto their voice, that's the under the agency part, how be it yet. So before you do that, you've got to do these two things first. How be it yet, first, protest solemnly unto them. In other words, let them know how you feel. And that's exactly what the brother of Jared does. I do not think this is a good idea. He protests solemnly. But then the second thing that the Lord tells Samuel, and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. Help them see the future of this decision. What is the consequence of their choice? And that also is exactly what the brother of Jared does. Surely this thing leadeth into captivity. That's the manner of the king that you will have. Someday, anyway. For the remainder of 1 Samuel chapter 8, Samuel does exactly that. He protests, he lets them know where he stands, and shows them the manner of what their future will entail. He talks about heavy taxation and the limitation of their freedoms, that it will lead them to trust in the arm of flesh and to end up rejecting God. By the way, all of those things will happen in the chapters we study this week. Keep an eye out for them. Everything that Samuel warned his people about, everything that must have been in the brother of Jared's mind, comes to pass in devastating ways. You get a similar sense from Mosiah chapter 29, when King Mosiah is realizing that kings are not in the best interest of his people. And so he shifts the government to a reign of judges instead, so that people will take more responsibility for their own decisions. He warns them that a lust for power would bring war and contention. He warns them that wicked leaders engender wicked followers. He warns them that a wicked king can't be removed except by much bloodshed and that wicked kings pervert the ways of righteousness. King Noah was exhibit A. 
And if you're looking for exhibit B through Z, all the rest of the alphabet, look no further than the wicked kings of Judah and Israel in the Old Testament and the wicked kings that will proliferate among the Jaredites in the chapters that follow. Now the sons of Jared and the sons of the brother of Jared all seem to kind of have this same sense. They realize that I think dad and uncle are right on this. And they seem grieved by the decision as well because they all refuse. They originally tag the firstborn of the brother of Jared. His name is Pegag and they want him to be king, but he refuses. I don't want to do it. I trust my father on this one. And in the middle of verse 25, the people end up wanting his father to constrain him, which is so ironic. It's like, guys, we're honoring your agency. Why can't you honor his? So often it's not enough for people to demand that they have it their way, but they want everyone else to follow their way as well. Thank you for honoring my agency. Now allow me to take away yours. No, no, no. We're going to honor agency all the ways around. Well, Pegag refuses, all of his brothers refuse, all of his cousins refuse, except one. In verse 27, all save it were one of Jared's sons refused the throne. But one, his name was Orihah, acquiesced and was anointed to be king over the people. The rest of the chapter briefly then describes his reign. And it was a good one, which is so merciful of the Lord. Speaking of the multitude of his tender mercies, he does the same thing with Samuel. I know they've rejected me, but it wasn't sour grapes and it wasn't, well, fine. They rejected me. I'm going to destroy them. You want a king? Fine. I'll give you the worst possible one. No, the Lord chose the best possible one. Someone who stood literally head and shoulders above the rest. Saul, who began his reign as a righteous king. He just didn't end it that way. This was no, I told you so, neener, neener on the part of God. This was, okay, if that's your will, then I'll do everything within my power to soften the potential negatives. I still love you. I'll still bless you. I'll still be merciful to you. But I cannot save you from every negative consequence of your negative decisions. Like I said, the reign of Orihah begins beautifully well. Verse 28, the people begin to prosper. They become exceedingly rich. 29, Jared and his brother have passed on, but in verse 30, Orihah walks humbly before the Lord, remembers how great things the Lord had done for his father, and taught his people how great things the Lord had done for their fathers. Chapter 6 ends with a beautiful summary of all that went before. Orihah walked humbly in the promised land because his fathers had walked humbly all the way from the Tower of Babel. He taught his people the great things that God had done for his ancestors just as his ancestors were taught from on high themselves. In chapter 7, verse 1, Orihah executes judgment upon the land in righteousness all his days, and those days are exceedingly many. You can almost get a sense from among certain Jaredites, perhaps, almost looking back at Jared and the, his brother's concerns, going, see, those were totally unfounded. We were fine. Choosing a king was a perfectly legitimate thing to do. But remember, Sometimes the distance between choice and consequence is a long, long way. Eventually, everything that Jared and his brother worried about came to pass. Surely, having a king did lead them to captivity, and it didn't take very long. It actually reminds me of the story in Acts chapter 27 of Paul on this ship voyage. Before they even set sail, Paul warned them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage. But they didn't listen to him. Well, what's he know? They listened to the master and the owner of the ship. Surely he understands currents and sailing conditions better than this tent maker from Tarsus. And beyond that, the haven that they were in for the winter was not commodious to winter in. You ever had that sense? Somebody warning you, this is where we need to stay, spiritually speaking. And you're like, ah, it's just not commodious. It's not comfortable. I can't do everything that I want to do. And what's the worst that could happen? So we launch out. It's the Mediterranean. I mean, you've seen it on the map. It's pretty small, right? We can make landfall and be fine. And then this really interesting detail in Acts 27. It says that the south wind blew softly. So they supposed that they had obtained their purpose. Like, see, it's fine. Nothing bad is going to happen. Paul, just go rest beneath deck. Everything's going to be fine. Feel that south wind? It's just going to gently bring us to our destination. No problem. 
Your fears are unfounded. Well, read the rest of Acts 27. That ship was destroyed, and those on board it were lucky to escape with their lives. It was all Paul could do not to say, I told you so. In fact, he did kind of say, I told you so. Because he had. So had the brother of Jared. Just give it time. Recognize that God does vindicate the prophets and that we do eventually pay the piper no matter how softly the south wind happens to be blowing. Heading down a wrong direction may seem totally fine at the start. It just doesn't end well, and it certainly doesn't for the Jaredites. Now for much of this, I want to simply summarize things, and then we can pinpoint principles once we find them in the various verses. You go from Ariha to his son Kib to his grandson Korahor. And Korahor rebels against his father, separates and dwells in the land of Nehor, begets sons and daughters, and his people become exceedingly fair. Wherefore, Korahor drew away many people after him. Interesting the names, by the way. Korahor and Nehor, we should recognize those from earlier in the Book of Mormon, which is later in history than this. I don't know if those names were intentionally echoed later in history, but to see Korahor as someone who rebels and Nehor as a place where they go to be away from the people of God. Sound like Korahor the Antichrist? Sound like the order of Nehors that pops up at the beginning of Alma? Perhaps they were taking those names advisedly, since both of those characters do show up after King Mosiah has translated the records of the Jaredites. I don't know, just a thought. But one principle that I think does apply regardless is this idea of a group becoming exceedingly fair, almost vanity fair, to the point that people are drawn away to follow them. We'll see that several times in this material. Are we caught up in those outward kinds of things? Fame or fortune or fun, beauty, whatever it might be, just that charisma in a worldly way drawing us away from the things of God? By verse 5, he'd gathered together an army. He came up to the land where the king dwelt and took him captive. Yes, this is his father. Thus it brought to pass the saying of the brother of Jared that they would be brought into captivity. This didn't even last three generations. The brother of Jared would have to say his, I told you so, from the grave. Now verse 6 gives us, I think, a piece of literary foreshadowing, which is interesting. Verse 6, Now the land of Moron, where the king dwelt, was near the land which is called Desolation by the Nephites. Now remember the Nephites called it Desolation because it bore the marks of a civilization that had been completely destroyed. This very first rebellion took them in the direction of Desolation. It pointed them towards that eventual demise. And that's what always happens when we leave the straight and narrow path. This is so early on in history. And we'll see by the end of this chapter that it gets resolved. It's okay. It's fine. But those first missteps so often get us closer to desolation than we realize. We're nearer our own destruction than we think. We've got to return, repent, to get back to the straight and narrow path. Now in verse 7 through 9, that rebel, Korahor, he's attacked and defeated by his own brother, Shul, another one of Orihah's grandsons who then restores the kingdom to his father, Kib. Again, don't worry about the names. There's no quiz at the end. But even in this brief passage, you see a son against a father, a brother against a brother. We're starting to see conflict within immediate families. But when all is said and done, it's, it's resolved. It comes back together. Verse 10, the father rewards the righteous son. Shul is given the kingdom. He begins to reign in the stead of his father. And good news, verse 11, it came to pass that he did execute judgment in righteousness. And prosperity results. His kingdom spreads upon all the face of the land. The people become exceedingly numerous. And best of all, verse 13, Korahor, this rebel brother, repents of the many evils which he had done. And is even granted some degree of power in the kingdom of his brother Shul. Sounds a lot like the prodigal son. And in this case, the brother isn't outside whining and withholding the, the ring and the, and the robe and the fatted calf, but rather, no, come back in. He that was dead is alive again. Happy ending. Unfortunately, it's not the ending. And so in this next chunk of verses, 14 through 17, Korahor's son Noah rebels against his uncle, Shul, and against his own father, Korahor. You wonder where he learned that trick. 
in a way this was like father like son unfortunately he takes his own uncle captive here and by verse 18 he plans to put his uncle to death but his cousins Shul's sons end up killing him and freeing their father so now we've gone from a father who rebels and repents to a son who rebels and doesn't repent. Instead, he plots murder and eventually is murdered himself. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland once gave an incredible conference talk called A Prayer for the Children. And in it, he talked about this tendency for one generation to just deviate somewhat and the next generation to deviate even further. An inactive man having an unbelieving son, for example, or an atheistic grandson deviations simply building upon themselves. I get a sense of that in this chapter from these generations. Sure enough, verse 19 to 21, the son of that man who rebelled against his father and his uncle, the one who plotted murder and eventually was murdered himself, his son remains divided ever after. He fights against the people of Shul, his own great uncle, and eventually is slain. So it's not just rebellion and then repentance. This is rebellion and permanent division. Things are getting worse. Now, it doesn't have to last forever. In verse 22, that rebel's son, his name is Nimrod, which I think is fascinating, since Nimrod is the name of that mighty hunter back in Babel who built the tower and started this whole problem to begin with. You wonder if Kohor, again, this permanent rebel, is naming his son this for a purpose looking to the wrong set of ancestors to remember. But just like there were wicked sons, in spite of them having righteous fathers, in this case, this seems to be a righteous son in spite of his wicked father. In verse 22, this son Nimrod gives up the kingdom of Kohor unto Shul. He heals the divide. He returns to the family, abdicates the throne that his father had usurped, and returns it to its rightful owner. So in Nimrod's case, it's not rebellion and division like his father, but rather repentance and return, like we saw in his grandfather. Again, it's really confusing, really hard to keep all these people straight. And again, don't worry, there's no quiz at the end. But it is fascinating when you have the chance to try to maintain family relationships in here and realize, wow, this really is father against son or uncle against nephew or cousin against cousin. This is crazy. We sometimes think our family reunions are awkward. Nothing like this. And by the time you get to verse 23, we start to see the Lord's solution, and he'll keep repeating it almost every chapter. What is the Lord going to do to try to help bring us back home? Verse 23, In the reign of Shul there came prophets among the people. They were sent from the Lord. They prophesied that the wickedness and idolatry of the people was bringing a curse upon the land, and they should be destroyed if they did not repent. Keep an eye out for that throughout these chapters. The Lord will continue to send prophets who will cry repentance and warn of destruction that will come if we don't return to the Lord. Unfortunately for them, verse 24, that the people did revile against the prophets and did mock them. We see that dichotomy over and over in the Book of Mormon as well, as well as in church history and in Joseph Smith's own personal history. On the one hand, they revile the prophets as if to try to maximize their perceived affront. And at the same time, they mock the prophets. In other words, to minimize their influence. They either blow it out of proportion up or blow it out of proportion down. To revile, get angry, or to mock and ridicule. Just shrug it off. We see the same thing happening in our day. But Shul has a solution for that. He executes judgment against all those who revile against the prophets. And then in 25, establishes a law throughout all the land that gives power unto the prophets to go whithersoever they would. He's basically establishing religious freedom in the face of persecution. And by this cause, the people were brought unto repentance because prophets were allowed to share their message. You remember the odd beginning to the 11th article of faith. Religious freedom isn't just something we believe in, like the other 12 articles of faith. Religious freedom is something that we actively claim. And in this case, Shul is claiming that for the people of God. There will be no obstruction to the Word of God. Prophets will have free access to the people that desperately need their message. They won't be forced to repent. Agency, again, is being honored. But the prophet's agency is being honored as well. I will not force you to listen, but please do not force me to remain silent. 
And 26, because the people repent of their iniquities and idolatries, the Lord spares them. They begin again to prosper in the land. And in verse 27, Ether 7 ends the same way Ether 6 did, with remembering. He remembered the great things that the Lord had done for his fathers and bringing them across the great deep into the promised land. That's why he executed judgment and righteousness all his days. You get a sense of how we overcome evil? We repent, we return, we remember. Now, unfortunately, not everyone does. And those that would rather reject than repent, those that would rather forget than remember, things only tend to get worse. Chapter 7, we started to see conflict within family. We started to see a loss of love and loyalty among family members. Chapter 8 is where we see the rise of secret combinations. Here we reach downtown Vanity Fair, where people are being pulled in all kinds of directions towards pride, towards lust, towards greed, ambition, to seek power and get gain. That's what these secret combinations are all about, and that's what chapter 8 is all about. Now, the idea of secret combinations is worth explaining a little bit from the start. In our day, combinations, we usually think of like locker combinations or things like that. A, a combination of numbers or a combination of ingredients to make some new substance, new compound. Now, the dictionary in 1828, the first American dictionary, the one that would describe what Joseph Smith in his time period would have understood of certain words. When Joseph Smith translated the words secret combination, what would have been in his mind? In that dictionary, the idea of numerical combinations is the fifth definition. The idea of combining things to form some new compound is the idea behind the second and third and fourth. What's the very first definition of combination in the 1828 dictionary? It is an intimate union or association of two or more persons or things by set purpose or agreement for affecting some object by joint operation. Now, Webster admitted this could be for either good or for evil. And he said sometimes this idea of combinations are equivalent to a league or a conspiracy. Now we're getting closer to what we're talking about in the Book of Mormon. It's a conspiracy that is meant to be kept secret. We don't want other people to find out about what we're, the, the plots that we're hatching behind closed doors. As we're combining our intelligence, our wickedness, our desires, I scratch your back, you scratch mine. We'll murder and get gain and nobody has to know. Now, two things to consider when you're thinking about secret combinations. One is what are they combining against? And the other is what are they combining for? The idea of what they're combining against actually establishes their identity more than any kind of internal similarities. Remember we saw this at the end of Mormon where the wicked have already destroyed all the righteous. You'd think everything would be fine there. They'd all be able to get along. But no, they just turn on each other. This idea of perpetual enemyship. I'm looking for someone to oppose. Well, these secret combinations are opposed to righteousness, opposed to freedoms, opposed to anything that would get in their way. That's what they're combining against. And what are they combining for? What are their purposes, their intentions, their goals? Primarily two things. We often see the phrase when it comes to secret combinations, to get power and get gain, or to murder and get gain. There always seems to be this empowerment side of things. That's kind of the political aspect. And then to get gain. That's the greed. That's the, the, the economic aspect. So you get ambition and greed you get political and economic. In the book of Revelation, these are personified as a beast. That's the political, that's power, that's ambition. And the merchant city of Babylon, that's the economic, that's the greed, the avarice. And throughout it all, there's a sense of wickedness and get it however you want to get it and satisfy self and I'm number one and those kinds of things. Pride runs throughout the entire spectrum. You get a bit of sense of this in the three temptations that Jesus faced as well that run throughout the Book of Mormon and elsewhere in Scripture. Now, in chapter 8, verse 1, you first meet Jared. Now, this is a Jared that is more of an anti-Jared compared to the original one we've met. The first Jared, remember his name means to go down. The first Jared was a going down in terms of humility and condescension. This Jared was a matter of taking down the people of the Jaredites along with him. Verse 2, Jared rebels against his father separates himself from him and dwells elsewhere, and then begins to flatter many people 
who began to believe him because of his cunning words. He ended up gaining half the kingdom from his father. Sound like the Antichrist we've already come to know in the Book of Mormon? Flattering words, cunning words. Again, that's why I spent so much time studying rhetoric when it comes to anti-religious attacks. It has to be flattering words. It has to be cunning words. In the realm of religion, you can't prove me wrong. This is faith. So what are you going to do instead when you have no empirical evidence that I'm wrong? You're going to say things in such a way that make me second-guess myself. You're going to flatter me away from my faith, or with your cunning, you'll draw me away from my covenants. How do I say things in such a way as to persuade you towards disbelief? It's fascinating to watch how that happens, both in our day as well as in Scripture. Well, in the verses that follow, Jared fights his father. He takes him captive, forces his father to serve in captivity all his days. But then Jared's brothers raise an army against him, defeat him, but decide to spare his life because he begs them for it. And he promises that he'll stay peaceful. Are you really going to trust somebody who's well known for his flattery and cunning? They weren't as wise as they needed to be. You see in verse 7, Jared is exceedingly sorrowful because of the loss of the kingdom. He'd set his heart upon the kingdom. He was upon the glory of the world. He wanted to establish a permanent residence in Pigeon Forge. He loved Vanity Fair, and his heart was set on it. Now notice, he was exceedingly sorrowful, and then verse 8, his daughter was both exceedingly expert, and 9, exceedingly fair. Now this is a dangerous combination, especially when this daughter is too loyal to her father, even as her father was not loyal enough to his. You see, this daughter of Jared will do anything to cheer up her dad. Let's, let's buy you stuff here in Vanity Fair. Come on, dad, it's going to be okay. Let's find a way to reclaim the kingdom. I see your exceeding sorrow, but good news. I'm exceedingly expert in terms of inward manipulation, and I'm exceedingly fair in terms of outward attraction. And that describes Vanity Fair perfectly. Just look at the world around us. It's amazing how exceedingly fair Vanity Fair is made to appear. Retouched photos, a virtual reality that makes real reality pale in comparison. Promises of fame and fortune, of popularity and pride, exceedingly fair and exceedingly expert at painting those kinds of pictures. The type of manipulation that the world is capable of as we keep scrolling through feeds and watching commercials and looking at this virtual reality all around us, no wonder we tend to fall for it, hook, line, and sinker. Please keep an eye out for the exceeding fair and exceeding expert things out there, whether it's advertising, whether it's movies in Hollywood, you name it. I leave you to ponder the possibilities of what those look like in your life or in your culture. But please, please be aware of what the world is doing to make things seem exceedingly fair, to somehow repackage and rebrand things so that evil begins to look like good, that we can repackage the bitter and make it taste sweet. Isaiah prophesied of all of these things, substituting light for darkness and sweet for bitter and good for evil, freedom for bondage and vice versa. The world has made itself look so exceedingly fair when it isn't. I love how Isaiah unmasks that when he talks about, oh yeah, it looks like well-set hair. In reality, it's baldness. It may look like a, a beautiful stomacher on the outside. It is rags that they're robed in. You may think that's intoxicating perfume, but it's more intoxication than real perfume. It is a stench that someday will hit the nostrils and you'll know for sure. It only looks exceedingly fair on the outside and now, but that is a fleeting fairness with a permanent ugliness underneath. It is only their exceeding expertise that is tricking you into seeing what they want you to see. We don't have to run around shouting conspiracy theory. These are secret combinations that we bring into our living room anytime we turn on the TV that we walk around holding in our hand as we're scrolling through our social media feed. Please don't get me wrong. 
there is so much good that can come of the internet and social media. It's a blessing whenever messages from the First Presidency or the Quorum of the Twelve shows up in my feed. But I am warning all of us to be aware of the daughter of Jared that lies behind so much of what we expose ourselves to. And we need to be a little more slow to be sucked in to the outward appearances that are made to seem so exceedingly fair. And we need to be a little quicker at recognizing some of the manipulative tactics that are used because of their exceeding expertise. If we're following Book of Mormon chronology, we seem to be somewhere in Helaman or 3rd Nephi. And there are secret combinations all throughout those chapters right before the destruction of the wicked and the coming of Christ. The Gadianton robbers are the most famous secret combination we're aware of in Scripture. And yet here's where we start seeing it developed among the Jaredite people. And the way it's described in Helaman chapter 2, it says that Gadianton, who was exceedingly expert in many words, and also in his craft to carry on the secret work of murder and of robbery. Murder to get power, robbery to get gain. Murder, there's the politics. Robbery, there's the economics. So do you see how similar Gadianton is to the daughter of Jared? They would have made quite the power couple, the two of them. Since it was power they were after. Both were exceedingly expert. He relied on his words. She relied on her looks. Neither one cared for real truth or inward beauty. And both are amazing at their craft to carry on secret works of murder and robbery. Now both have a long line of precedence to follow. In verse 9 we see that the daughter of Jared is familiar with the records that their people have had. Talk about counterfeit remembering. We saw with Orihah, we saw with Shul, righteousness comes when you remember the things that God had done for their fathers. Well, sadly, she has the records whereby she could remember all of these things. But instead, what does she recall? The wickedness, the secret oaths and combinations that went before her. She goes to her dad and says, whereby hath my father so much sorrow? Hath he not read the record which our fathers brought across the great deep? Again, what could have solved your sorrow by seeing the hand of God? No. Behold, is there not an account concerning them of old that they by their secret plans did obtain kingdoms and great glory? There's ambition, there's pride, there's wealth. Verse 10, now therefore, here's my plan, Dad. Let my father send for Achish, the son of Kimnor. And behold, I am fair. I will dance before him. I will please him that he will desire me to wife. Wherefore, if he shall desire of thee that ye shall give unto him me to wife, then shall ye say, I will give her, if ye will bring unto me the head of my father, the king. Now, don't let Jared's relationship to the king mask the fact that his daughter's relationship to the king is there as well. It's not just bring me the head of my father. The girl that is suggesting this is talking about her own grandfather here. Dad, I know what we can do. We get you the kingdom back by killing grandpa. This is horrific. She doesn't care about that family connection. She doesn't care about love, only cares about lust. Marriage doesn't mean anything to her. I can appeal to the lust of Achish. And dad, you can satisfy your lust for power by allowing me to satisfy Achish's lust for pleasure. You see, Satan doesn't care which temptation you fall to. If Achish is going to succumb to the first great temptation, great. Let's leverage that so that then Jared can succumb to the third. All along, Jared's daughter, so prideful in her plan, is probably succumbing to the second. This is so similar to Herodias and John the Baptist in the New Testament. In both instances, they disguised lust as love and pawned themselves off on someone that they were playing. Exceedingly expert indeed. Tragically, verse 11, Omer was a friend to Achish. So this guy that's going to be used to try to destroy the king, he likes the king. This again is a similarity between Herod and John the Baptist. Herod respected John, believed in his words. But when push came to shove, lost any sense of loyalty, just like is happening here with Achish. Here in Ether 8, the plan proceeds exactly as the daughter of Jared had envisioned. She dances before Achish. She pleases him as she knew she would. 
And so Achish goes to Jared and says, give her unto me to wife. Verse 12, Jared says in return, I will. You can have her if you can give me what I want. If you will bring unto me the head of my father and your friend, he could add, the king. Well, with lust over loyalty, in verse 13, Achish gathers in unto the house of Jared all his kinsfolk. And this is where we see the beginning of this secret combination forming. He says to his kinsfolk at the end of 13, Will ye swear unto me that ye will be faithful unto me in the thing which I shall desire of you? They don't even know what they're getting themselves into yet. But will you swear to be faithful unto me? Forget about covenanting to be faithful to God. Swear to be faithful to me. Verse 14, they agree. They all swear unto him, by the God of heaven and also by the heavens, which is so ironic and blasphemous, since the God of heaven has nothing to do with this. But they swear by heaven, they swear by earth, they swear by their own heads. Their own life is on the line here. That whoso should vary from the assistance which Achish desired should lose his head. And whoso should divulge whatsoever thing Achish made known unto them, the same should lose his life. That's where you get the secrecy in the secret combination. Verse 15, we see the precedent. It came to pass that thus they did agree with Achish, and Achish did administer unto them the oaths which were given by them of old. Those were the things that caught the daughter of Jared's eye on the records. Those oaths that were given by them of old, who also sought power, which had been handed down even from Cain, who was a murderer from the beginning. And they were kept up by the power of the devil to administer these oaths unto the people, to keep them in darkness, to help such as sought power to gain power, and to murder, and to plunder, and to lie, and to commit all manner of wickedness and whoredoms. You sense the devil's goals here? To keep the blind in darkness, to give power to the power hungry, to lead them down a path paved with depravity, murder and plunder, dishonesty, wickedness, whoredoms, all cobbled together from the three great temptations the adversary threw in the Savior's face. It's telling that they connected it all back down to Cain, you remember what Satan says to Cain in the version in the Pearl of Great Price? Moses chapter 5. Satan said unto Cain, Swear unto me by the throat, and if thou tell it, thou shalt die. And swear thy brethren by their heads, and by the living God, that they tell it not. Doesn't that sound exactly like what he's saying to the, his own family members back in verse 14? That you'll lose your head if you tell for if they tell it, Satan continues, they shall surely die. And this that thy father may not know it. And this day I will deliver thy brother Abel into thine hands. And Satan swear unto Cain that he would do according to his commands. And all these things were done in secret. So the first combination between Satan and Cain to murder your brother to get gain over his flocks. Ambition, you don't have to listen to him anymore. Greed, you can have what belongs to him, and no one has to know. Cain responds, truly I am Mahan, the master of this great secret, that I may murder and get gain. There it is. Murder, political power over someone else to the point that they have no power at all. They're gone. And get gain, avarice, greed, the economic side of things the beast and the merchant city alive and well, as they always have been. Later in that same chapter, for from the days of Cain, there was a secret combination and their works were in the dark. And that just got passed down generation after generation. When you get to those Helaman chapters where the Gadianton robbers are the secret combination of the day, Nephi sees in his time period that they began to commit secret murders and to rob and to plunder that they might get gain. Same playbook in Helaman 7 when the Gadianton robbers fill the judgment seats and condemn the righteous because of their righteousness. Sound like what they're trying to do to persecute the prophets throughout Jaredite history? They let the guilty and wicked go unpunished because of their money? Of course, you can buy your way into the good graces of the legal system if all they want is their own gain rather than justice. All of this in pursuit of political power so that everyone can get gain and glory of the world. So that way you can more easily commit adultery and steal and kill and do everything according to your own will. That was the time period prior to the coming of Christ. Nephi himself says this as he is crying repentance. It is to get gain 
third great temptation. To be praised of men, second great temptation. Yea, and that ye might get gold and silver, more of the third. Ye have set your hearts upon the riches and the vain things of this world. Oh, they make it look so exceedingly fair. That's what vanity fair is all about. For the which ye do murder and plunder and steal and bear false witness against your neighbor. There's the beast, the political side. And do all manner of iniquity. There's the first great temptation. It's all there. It started with Cain. More accurately, it started in the war in heaven. And Satan has been playing those same tricks ever since. No wonder. They work. He is exceedingly expert. He uses flattering words. He has cunning language to try to convince us that Vanity Fair is exactly where we were supposed to be. There's no need to return to God in heaven when you can make heaven appear here on earth. What a convincing mirage. Now back to the story. Ether 8.17 it was the daughter of Jared who put it into his heart to search up these things of old. And then Jared put it into the heart of Achish. Wherefore Achish administered it unto his kindred and friends, leading them away by fair promises to do whatsoever thing he desired. It's another great phrase to add to our list. The exceedingly expert, the exceedingly fair, the secret plans, the secret combinations, the fair promises. By the way, that phrase, fair promises, shows up elsewhere in the Book of Mormon. When overzealous Zenith goes back down to the land of Nephi, wanting to reclaim his father's inheritance, and King Laman, with fair promises, same phrase, says, oh, of course you can stay. When in reality, all he wanted was to keep them in bondage, there's the power, and to tax them, there's the get gain. Same goals as always. And the same tactics, fair promises that they never intended to keep. That's what Satan offered Cain, fair promises. He couldn't fulfill any of them, but they sure sounded good. You can take your brother's place. You can take your brother's flock. Again, isn't that what Lucifer was after from the beginning? To take his brother, Jehovah's place in the plan? To usurp power over his brother's flock, each of us? To take the Father's throne, it's so exactly what's happening here. And to reassure Cain all along, and no one's going to know. And here we are thousands of years later, still reading about it. Oh, we know. Your combination, Cain, wasn't that secret after all. But in verse 18, we see it clearly now. They formed a secret combination. Not so secret after all. Even as they of old, which combination is most abominable and wicked above all in the sight of God. Remember we saw that at the end of Mormon, that he called it a secret abomination, which I think was either a Freudian slip or a much more accurate description of what these things are. A secret abomination. And why are they so abominable and wicked in the sight of God? Because verse 19 tells us that the Lord doesn't work that way. He doesn't work in secret combinations. And he doesn't want us to either. He doesn't want us to shed blood, especially for ill-gotten gain. He forbids it, and he always has from the beginning of man. God prefers honesty and openness to secrecy. He prefers coming together in unity instead of combining against each other in opposition. Remember we saw this earlier? That the three great temptations destroy the three essential elements of Zion that will never be of one heart and one mind the first essential element of Zion, unity. If we succumb to pride, the second great temptation. That we'll never dwell in righteousness, the second essential element of Zion. If we succumb to physical appetite and the lust of the flesh, the first great temptation. And we'll never get to the point where we have no poor among us, the third essential element of Zion. If we succumb instead to worldliness and materialism, the third great temptation. There's such a perfect parallel between those two. Zion and what is required of it versus Babylon and what is trying to draw out of us. Jesus overcame them all as he began his ministry to lead us to Zion. We have to be able to make it through Pigeon Forge if we're ever going to get to the Smoky Mountains. We have to learn to make it through Vanity Fair. 
Now Moroni stops us here, and he'll end chapter 8 with his own thoughts about these oaths and secret combinations. He's now a record keeper, right? And he's seen that they had found in the records these secret oaths and ancient combinations. So he says in verse 20, Now I, Moroni, do not write the manner of their oaths and combinations. We saw Mormon talk about similar things, and Mosiah talk about similar things. Alma talk about similar things with his son Helaman. Some things need to be revealed. Other things must not be. Reveal their righteousness. Conceal the source of their wickedness. Here Moroni is doing likewise. I'm not going to write their oaths and their combinations. Not the manner of them, at least. I'm not going to give you details on how to administer them. I'm simply going to show you the results of them. And it's not just that I shouldn't. It's that, unfortunately, I don't need to. Because it's been made known unto me all too clearly that they are already had among all people. They're had among the Lamanites. You see how Moroni jumps really quickly from the history he's writing to the history he's living? And he's realizing, no wonder our people were brought down to destruction. We succumbed to the same things. We didn't need a daughter of Jared. We had a Gadianton. We didn't need Cain. We had Kishkumen. We don't even need records to explain the details. We just need people who are willing to succumb to the natural man. How frail we are to be drawn to such fleeting things. Ambition, greed, beast, merchant city, to seek power and to get gain. Verse 21, Moroni sees it all too clearly now. They, these secret combinations, have caused the destruction of this people of whom I am now speaking, the Jaredites, and also the destruction of the people of Nephi. Remember, this is part of what was driving Moroni at the end of the Book of Mormon, to see the destruction of two civilizations and to plead with a third not to follow suit. Ours. Are we succumbing to our own desires for gain or for power? We have to be wiser than they were. Verse 22, that's exactly what Moroni is encouraging. Whatsoever nation shall uphold such secret combinations. They're not so secret. They're all around us. Those secret combinations to get power and gain, they're two great objectives. Until they shall spread over the nation, behold, they shall be destroyed. For the Lord will not suffer that the blood of his saints, which shall be shed by them, again, because it's the saints that are standing in their way, the prophets that are preaching Zion, that give the lie to Babylon. It's the light that allows us to clearly discern the darkness. That blood which shall be shed by them shall always cry unto God from the ground for vengeance upon them. God won't always ignore those cries. He won't always avenge them not. Remember, we saw that in the destruction of the wicked in 3 Nephi 8, 9, and 10. So what does Moroni urge us to do? Verse 23, Wherefore, O ye Gentiles, it is wisdom in God that these things should be shown unto you, not the oaths and combinations, but the result of them, that thereby ye may repent of your sins, just like the prophets have always cried. And suffer not that these murderous combinations shall get above you. See, back in 22, they were just spreading over the nations. Now we're letting them get above us. They are built up to get power, there's the beast, and gain, there's the merchant city. And the work, yea, even the work of destruction come upon you. Yea, even the sword of the justice of the eternal God shall fall upon you to your overthrow and destruction, if ye shall suffer these things to be. Wherefore, the Lord commandeth you, when ye shall see these things come among you. When you start to see that people who are exceedingly expert are trying to make ugliness look exceedingly fair. When you see these things that ye shall awake to a sense of your awful situation because of this secret combination which shall be among you. Or woe be unto it because of the blood of them who have been slain, for they cry from the dust for vengeance upon it and also upon those who built it up. Are we asleep to these things? Or are we awake to a sense of our awful situation? Now, I am not an alarmist. I'm not a doomsdayer. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. But I am a student of the scriptures and a student of the history of anti-religious rhetoric, which has fascinated me for the last decade. To see the flattery, to see the cunning words. I typically try to read about a book a week, usually on public transportation. 
And I remember once I was reading a book and a student of mine happened to be on the train and looked over and said, oh, what are you reading? And I said, oh, this is a history of advertising in the United States. And they looked at me strange like, what? Does that have anything to do with teaching the gospel? And my thought was, more than you think. To see commercialization and commodification, to just try to understand the tactics that are out there in Vanity Fair. So that instead of seeing a commercial, I can see through a commercial. Instead of seeing anti-Mormonism, I can see through anti-Mormonism to try to become exceedingly expert at detecting the exceeding expertise of those that are trying to attack faith and to detect the smoke and mirrors, the sleight of hand behind the tactics of the adversary that have been successful for him for so, so long. And honestly, this is less about navigating Madison Avenue it's more about navigating the straight and narrow path that happens to lead through Vanity Fair on the way to the celestial city. We have to be more awake than we often are. Moroni concludes the warning in 25 by saying, It cometh to pass that whoso buildeth it up seeketh to overthrow the freedom of all lands, nations, and countries, and it bringeth to pass the destruction of all people, for it is built up by the devil who is the father of all lies, even that same liar who beguiled our first parents, yea, even that same liar who hath caused man to commit murder from the beginning, who hath hardened the hearts of man that they have murdered the prophets and stoned them and cast them out from the beginning. This is a dire warning, but it's coming from someone who lived through it himself. This wasn't just painting some kind of worst case scenario. This was painting the scenario through which he lived. No wonder he's giving his life to the same purpose that his father gave his. You sense that in verse 26. Wherefore, so because of all this that I've lived through and I'm seeing in this earlier history and I'm seeing in future prophecy of the last days, wherefore I, Moroni, am commanded to write these things. You've got to see that it's happened. It happened once, Jaredites. It happened twice, Nephites. It must not happen in the latter day. You have to awaken to a sense of your awful situation. You have to be able to overcome the evil that is around you. You've got to see through the smoke and mirrors. And so I'm writing these things. Why? I love his list. Number one, that evil may be done away. Number two, that the time may come that Satan may have no power upon the hearts of the children of men. Number three, but that they may be persuaded to do good continually. Four, that they may come unto the fountain of all righteousness. That's Jesus. So that, number five, they can be saved. You understand the power of what truth does? It's the opposite of what falsehood is meant to accomplish. Remember, the Lord doesn't work by those means. It's not secret combination. It's open consecration. And what is truth meant to accomplish? It eliminates evil instead of building it up. It robs Satan of power over people instead of giving him the power that he seeks. It persuades people to do good continually instead of evil. It brings people to Christ, the fountain of all righteousness, instead of leading them towards the adversary, the fountain of filthy water that Lehi saw. And its ultimate result is salvation instead of damnation. This is a war and Moroni, having seen his people lose it, is trying to help us win it. That's one of the purposes of the Book of Mormon. Oh, that you can be wiser than we have been. Can you hear the voice from the dust? Let our consequences be your cautionary tale and be better. Be wiser. Be purer. Be more humble care less about power and less about gain. Look at the merchants and salesmen in Vanity Fair and smile and say, I'm just not interested. Drive through Pigeon Forge. Get past Gatlinburg. Make it to the Smoky Mountains. It's what you set out to see all along. Now, once you understand what's been laid before us, especially in chapter 8, 
about these secret combinations that Moroni is warning us against, then chapter 9 and chapter 10 can go by very quickly. You see, as 9 begins, the secret combinations have taken control. But God is merciful to the king. In verse 3, he warns him in a dream to depart out of that land. And so he takes his family and goes. Sound like Lehi leaving Jerusalem? Sound like Nephi leaving Laman? Sound like Mosiah leaving the wicked people of his day? That is one thing the Lord can always help us to accomplish, is to depart evil and find a better place to gather with the faithful. There will be times the Spirit prompts you to leave. So often that doesn't even require a physical relocation, but a change of perspective, a turning of the eye away from the window shopping at Vanity Fair to be able to focus on the goal at the end of the path the celestial city that still glistens in the distance. Just move, turn, heed the warnings that you're given. Now, based on the secret combination that Jared and his daughter and Achish all started to form, it goes according to plan. Achish kills Jared's father. Jared regains the throne by the hand of wickedness. But then ironically, though not unexpectedly, Achish, who had turned on Jared's father, now turns on Jared. How could he not? There is no loyalty here. If he was willing to kill his friend, why wouldn't he turn and try to kill the person who put him up to it? You see, he'd already succumbed to the lust for sensual pleasure when it came to Jared's daughter. Well, now he's succumbing to the lust for political power where it comes to the kingdom of Jared himself. Verse 5, Achish sought the life of his father-in-law. He applied unto those whom he had sworn by the oath of the ancients, and they obtained the head of his father-in-law. These were two heads for the price of one. And Achish is now on the throne. Verse 6, so great had been the spreading of this wicked and secret society. Remember what Moroni had said, they allowed it to get above them. It corrupted the hearts of the people, all of them. Therefore Jared was murdered upon his throne, and Achish reigned in his stead. But just like Achish had jealousy and pride looking up at his father-in-law, the king, he even had jealousy and pride looking down at his own children. Verse 7, Achish began to be jealous of his son. Therefore, he shut him up in prison and kept him upon little or no food until he had suffered death. It's getting worse and worse. Achish is so hungry for power, so eager to feed his own ambition, that he refuses to feed his own son who starves to death in prison at his father's hand. We saw hints of that back in chapter 7. Loss of love and loyalty within families. We'll couple that with secret combinations, and it only goes worse. Now, another son of Achish, the brother of the one that was starved to death in prison, is angry about that. But instead of fighting his father, he flees and joins the righteous. Again, that's always an option for us to leave wicked influences and find righteous people to gather with. That becomes more and more important as the last days intensify. Now, 10 and 11 are interesting because these other sons of Achish, remember one has been killed in prison, another one has fled to join the righteous, but the rest of these sons, they're as thirsty for power as their father was, like father, like sons in this case. And they know they can leverage the people's thirst for wealth to satisfy their thirst for power. You get that sense in verse 11. The people of Achish were desirous for gain. That's what they were after. Even as Achish was desirous for power. That's what he and his sons were after. Wherefore the sons of Achish did offer them money. That satisfies their desire for gain. By which means they drew away the more part of the people after them. That satisfied their lust for power. You get a sense of, I'll give you what you want if you give me what I want. No wonder they're combining together for these things. Both sides combining against whoever they needed to, to be able to combine for whatever it was that they wanted. You want gain? Great. Well, I want power. It's like what we saw about the difference between the records and the plates last time. That Satan wanted the record destroyed. He didn't care about the plates. But he knew that the people wanted the plates because they were gold and couldn't care less about the record. So again, it's you get what you want, by giving me what I want. This is where commercialism and consumerism come together. Where they're preying on us wanting stuff. There's the consumerism. And they just want to make money off the stuff that we want. There's the commercialism. 
So we can satisfy our commercialism by ramping up your consumerism. We'll give you anything you want as long as you give us what we want. And power and money, money and power, changing hands all the time. By the time verse 12 hits, it's erupted in full-fledged war between Achish and his sons. It lasts for many years, and it leads to the near-complete destruction of the people. Only 30 souls remain, and they all flee to the house of Omer, the good guys. In some ways, verse 12 is a mini dress rehearsal for the end of the Jaredite civilization, and the end of the Nephite one, for that matter. So much conflict within this combination of power and gain they end up fighting against each other in a war of mutual annihilation with only a remnant of the righteous remaining. We have to learn from these mistakes. That is the Battle of Armageddon in a nutshell. Self-defeating armies of evil. We'll see it next week among the Jaredites. We saw it two weeks ago among the Nephites. A future generation will see it at Armageddon. There's even an interesting chapter, Second Chronicles chapter 20 that shows it happening in the days of ancient Israel under the reign of King Jehoshaphat, where he's told, step back and watch the salvation of God. And then the enemies of Israel end up fighting against one another and destroying each other. It's exactly what's happening here. And meanwhile, King Omer, the good guy, who in verse 13 is restored to the land of his inheritance, and who in verse 15 sees peace in the land for his last two years of life, still is full of sorrow. And how could he not be, considering all that his people have been through, no matter how happy this happy ending? But happy it was for a time. Omer's son, Emer, is someone I wish we knew more about. He reigns in his father's stead and thankfully follows in his father's righteous footsteps. And verse 16, the Lord began again to take the curse from off the land. Remember, it's promised as long as you keep my promises. They began to, and so it became more and more promised once again. The house of Emer did prosper exceedingly under his reign. They became exceedingly strong. They became exceedingly rich. In verse 20, the Lord did pour out his blessings upon the land, which was choice above all other lands. He commanded that whoso should possess the land should possess it unto the Lord, or they should be destroyed when they were ripened in iniquity. It's exactly what Mormon and Moroni had said about this land of promise. Verse 21, And Emer did execute judgment in righteousness all his days, like Shul had before him, like Orihah had before him, like Jared and his brother had originally. And best of all, verse 22, As Emer had already passed the crown on to his son Coriantum, the last four years of Emer's life he saw peace in the land, and better yet, he saw the Prince of Peace. Yea, he even saw the Son of Righteousness and did rejoice and glory in his day. And he died in peace. I love that tucked away in this tragic tale of descent toward destruction, you see someone like an Emer executing judgment in righteousness keeping the promises that made the land the promised land, possessing it, but possessing it unto the Lord instead of just for his own gain of power or prosperity. He possessed the land, but the land didn't possess him. He wore a crown, but it never went to his head. And best of all, he came to know Christ. It's the only real solution there is. No wonder he could rejoice and glory. No wonder he could die in peace. We still have those kinds of opportunities. These little pockets of gathered saints, consecrating one heart, one mind, dwelling in righteousness, no poor among us, gathered together, plowing our way through Vanity Fair with our eyes fixed on the celestial city and single to the glory of God, full speed ahead following the Son of Righteousness. There are generations of righteousness that follow, and sadly, there are generations of exceedingly great wickedness as well. By the end of 26, you have a king named Heth who begins to embrace the secret plans again of old to destroy his father. In 27, he dethrones him and slays him. 
So sad how short that window of righteousness seemed to be before they descended once again into the same old problems. And what was the Lord's solution here as it had been previously? Verse 28, there came prophets in the land again, crying repentance unto them. That is always the Lord's solution. These prophets cried that they must prepare the way of the Lord, make way for that son of righteousness that an earlier king had come to know. Otherwise, there should come a curse upon the face of the land, as there had been previously. But rather than the curse of war that they had suffered so many times before, now it would be a curse of famine, a great famine in which they should be destroyed if they did not repent. Sounds a lot like Nephi facing the secret combinations of his day as he prays for a famine that would not just empty the bellies, but would soften the hearts of his people, turn them to God. Now, at first that didn't work. In verse 29, the people believed not the words of the prophets. Why would they? You have no proof, and worse yet, you have no power. And you have no gain. You have nothing to offer us. Well, they offered more than they realized. But these wicked non-believers cast them out. Some of them they cast into pits, left them to perish. And all this according to the commandment of the king. How far they've fallen from earlier when a previous king had made commandments to allow prophets to have free access to the people. No obstruction to the word. Well, now the king is clamping down on religious freedom. And you can predict the result. Verse 30, however, God did vindicate the prophets. A famine came just as prophesied. There began to be a great dearth upon the land. The inhabitants began to be destroyed exceedingly fast because of the dearth. For there was no rain upon the face of the earth. And then, verse 31, poisonous serpents come forth upon the face of the land to poison the people until many perish by the way. With the mention of poisonous serpents, I can't help but think of the Israelites in the Exodus and the fiery flying serpents that bit them. And what was the solution to the problem then? Moses makes this brazen serpent and tells the people to look and live, to believe in the promises of God, to return to the God of Israel. And that's exactly what would be required of the people here. And eventually they do look and they do live. At the end of verse 34, when the people saw that they must perish, they began to repent of their iniquities and cry unto the Lord, just as the prophets that they had rejected had told them to. 35, it came to pass that when they had humbled themselves sufficiently before the Lord, he did send rain upon the face of the earth and the people began to revive again. There began to be fruit in the north countries and in all the country round about. Best of all, they began to regain access to the fruit of the tree of life that was always there waiting for them, always extended. The Lord did show forth his power unto them in preserving them from famine and would continue to do so if they would simply continue to look to him and live. Some did, and sadly, some didn't. Chapter 10, the alternation between good and evil continues. The beginning of the chapter you meet a king named Shez who begins to build up again a broken people broken by outward circumstances perhaps but more importantly a people with a broken heart and a contrite spirit that's the kind of people he is trying to build up again and how does Shez do it in verse 2 he does it the same way we saw it at the end of previous chapters he remembered he remembered the destruction of his fathers, and he built up a righteous kingdom. He remembered what the Lord had done in bringing Jared and his brother across the deep. And as a result of that active remembering, he did walk in the ways of the Lord. Unfortunately, in verse 3, he has a son who rebels, who gains exceeding riches, and is eventually smitten by the hand of a robber. Remember, the wealth we possess ends up possessing us. And in wanting all this riches, he was smitten by someone who wanted them even more. In verse 5, we meet another successor named Riplakish. Riplakish, in many ways, is the Jaredite equivalent of King Noah. You see him succumb to all the great temptations. He did not do that which was right in the sight of the Lord. There's an understatement. For he did have many wives and concubines. There's the first great temptation. And did lay that upon men's shoulders which was grievous to be born. Yea, he did tax them with heavy taxes. And with the taxes, he did build many spacious buildings. That's the third great temptation. And he did erect him an exceedingly beautiful throne. 
There's the second great temptation, pride. You see both the power and gain that he's after. Satan doesn't have to get that creative. We all seem to want the same kinds of stuff. His temptations just keep working generation after generation. But his people eventually revolt and kill him. So in a similar way to the man we met earlier who was amassing wealth and then smitten by the hand of a robber. Well, Replikish amasses all this wealth and power and eventually is attacked by the people he's taking it from. He is undone by his own lust, his own ambition, and his own greed. Now, verses 9 through 12 is a fascinating little glimpse into another successive king named Morianton. He has some of the problems of his predecessors, but not all of them. What's interesting in his case, at the end of 9, he gains power over the land. So he's still power hungry. But in 10, he eases the burden of the people. So he's not quite as materialistic. Ambition is a problem, but not so much greed. And because he eases off on their taxes, he gains their support. Perhaps another version of, I'll get what I want if I give you what you want. But interesting the way it's phrased in verse 11. I think this sadly describes a lot of political leaders in our day as well. And he did do justice unto the people, but not unto himself, because of his many whoredoms. Wherefore, he was cut off from the presence of the Lord. So interesting. To do justice to others, but not to self. Under Maxwell once talked about social commendables, not compensating for moral inexcusables. And that's exactly what's happening here. I'll ease your tax burden, but I won't ease my own burden of sin. And there's an irony here that even though he is less materialistic and lowers people's taxes, they become more materialistic as a result. They got more money to spend upon themselves. You see that take place in verse 12. Now through the rest of this chapter, you see a few wicked kings, you see a few righteous kings, war and rebellion on one side, righteousness and prosperity on another. During their periods of righteousness, the people spread, they're wise in their resources, they're industrious, they become even more prosperous. The best description comes in verse 28, and never could be a people more blessed than were they, and more prospered by the hand of the Lord. And they were in a land that was choice above all lands, for the Lord had spoken it. They kept the promises and therefore deserved the promised land. But sadly, by the end of the chapter, after some more rebellion and war and kings reigning in captivity, in verse 33, there began to be robbers again in the land. And they adopted the old plans. They administered the old oaths after the manner of the ancients and sought again to destroy the kingdom. By now, we should be used to this. The swinging pendulum, going back and forth between wickedness and righteousness. What is it that pulls the pendulum towards wickedness? Lust, ambition, greed, pride. And what is it that pulls it back towards righteousness? Or perhaps we might rephrase the question, who is it that pulls it back towards righteousness? prophets, as always. That's what we see in chapter 11. Verse 1, there came also in the days of calm many prophets. Do we see this happening over and over and over again through these chapters? I hope that is one golden thread we recognize each time it pops up. God has not given up on his people. He keeps sending prophets into their midst to cry repentance, to prophesy of the destruction of that people, except they should repent and turn unto the Lord and forsake their murders and wickedness. In verse 2, the prophets are rejected by the people, and the people seek to destroy them. But this righteous man come, received them, protected them, and he was blessed in all the remainder of his days. More rebellion in four, more prophets come in five. But at the end of five, all of those prophets are put to death because they prophesied of the destruction of the people. Exactly what King Noah did to Abinadi. And for the same reason, quit warning us about the consequences of sin. Quit hanging the sword of God's justice over our heads. Let us eat, drink, and be merry. For tomorrow we die, and who cares what happens afterwards? 
whether our combinations are secret or not. We are here to murder and get gain. We are here for ambition and for greed. And we're never going to leave Vanity Fair. Mercifully, remember the multitude of his tender mercies? The Lord still hasn't given up on these people. In spite of the opposition of the wicked to these prophets, the prophets had been able to get their word out. We see it in its more complete version in verse 6 and 7. The prophecies were of great calamity in the land. They had testified that a great curse should come upon the land and also upon the people, and that there should be a great destruction among them, such an one as never had been upon the face of the earth. Their bones should become as heaps of earth upon the face of the land, except they should repent of their wickedness. That's very similar to the description that the people of Limhi left when they first discovered the land of desolation. Verse 7, They hearkened not unto the voice of the Lord because of their wicked combinations. Wherefore there began to be wars and contentions in all the land, and also many famines and pestilences, insomuch that there was a great destruction, such an one as never had been known upon the face of the earth. Exactly as prophesied, with the Lord trying everything he can, war, famine, pestilence, anything to wake you up, all of which were much more dramatic than the call to awake and arise and repent that had come from the prophets. Now, they had hit the snooze bar whenever the prophets spoke. They'd slept through that, but they couldn't sleep through famine and pestilence and war continually. And so in verse 8, the people began to repent of their iniquity. They could have done that so much earlier and easier if they'd listened to the prophets that were sent to them. But even now, late as it was, once they repented, the Lord did have mercy on them. He never said, it's too late now. He never said, that was the last straw. God's mercy is tireless. His redemption is relentless. It is a multitude of tender mercies we saw earlier. And he never runs out. I hope that gives us hope as we sometimes seem to be following the Jaredite decline. We can follow their repentance as well. Well, more time passes and by verse 12, guess who comes back into the land? More prophets. That is the standard. There may be times of famine and pestilence and war and contention, but prophets is what the Lord prefers to do in calling people home. There came many prophets and prophesied again unto the people. Yea, they did prophesy that the Lord would utterly destroy them from off the face of the earth, except they repented of their iniquities. The alarm clock keeps getting louder and louder. Sooner or later, you will be unable to drown out the decibels. Verse 13, that time hadn't yet come. The people hardened their hearts and would not hearken unto the words. And the prophets mourned, and they withdrew from among the people. We saw that in Mormon's day, when the Lord withheld the spirit, pulled back the three Nephites, told Mormon to keep his mouth closed. These people are intent on living without God in the world. Well, let's let them try. Perhaps that will wake them up. It didn't in their case, at least not yet. Verse 14, more wickedness. Verse 15, a rebellion because of that secret combination which was built up to get, you guessed it, power and gain. More iniquities, more battles, more overthrowing of enemies, more time in captivity. And verse 20, yet more prophets. There also came many prophets and prophesied of great and marvelous things and cried repentance unto the people. And except they should repent, the Lord God would execute judgment against them to their utter destruction. And then this addition, verse 21, a prophecy that the Lord God would send or bring forth another people to possess the land by his power, after the manner by which he brought their fathers. You see the new insight that they've been given? If it's utter destruction because of an utter rejection of God's goodness, then God will start over again. He did it with Noah, a second Adam. He'll do it with Lehi, a second brother of Jared. I'm amazed at God's willingness to try again and allow someone to keep the promises in order to inherit a promised land. 
it will have to be us since it wasn't the Nephites and since it wasn't the Jaredites. In both previous instances, verse 22 took place. They did reject all the words of the prophets because of their secret society and wicked abominations. And that's when we meet in verse 23, Ether, born in the days of his father's captivity, which was all his father ever knew. This is all that Ether would ever know. Ether was his civilization's Moroni. And next week, as we'll see the two of them, Ether and Moroni, almost tag team teach us in hopes that we will not do what their people did, that we will be wiser than they, that we will awake to the realities of secret societies and wicked combinations, and instead listen to the words of prophets. Repent of our sins and come unto the Son of Righteousness, who is willing to come unto us in spite of the wickedness of our days. In some, these difficult chapters describe the sins and the solutions so beautifully, the secret combinations of the wicked and the open obedience of the righteous. On the sin side, it describes so powerfully the turning to worldly kings at the expense of our heavenly one. It describes the loss of love and loyalty within our families and secret combinations in pursuit of wickedness and power and gain. And on the side of solution, it teaches us that as much as it is possible, we can flee Babylon. We can turn our back on Sodom and Gomorrah and never look back. We can gather out from among the wicked and assemble as the righteous in our homes, in our wards, in the garner of God, which is the temple. As much as humanly possible, we can avoid evil influences. We can listen to the voice of prophets pleading with us to repent and come unto Christ. In fact, I mentioned briefly the battle that took place in the days of King Jehoshaphat when the wicked ended up destroying each other. It's in that chapter that Jehoshaphat says to his people, Believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. And believe in his prophets, so shall ye prosper. Do you want to be established on this promised land? Then establish your faith in Christ. And you want to prosper in the promised land? Then that spiritual prosperity comes as we follow the words of living prophets. What else do we do? We remember. We remember the great things that God has done for us and for our fathers. We never allow Vanity Fair to cloud our remembrance of the visions of the city of God that we've seen in the distance. And most importantly, we seek the Son of Righteousness. As Malachi said, we know that He will rise with healing in His wings. Well, we can come and seek the shelter of those wings far in advance of his coming. We can look at the world all around us in comparison to the sun of righteousness that is before us and see how little it has to offer. We can see past the facade of Vanity Fair and look at what the world says is exceedingly fair and say, it has no appeal to me. And see what the world considers exceedingly expert and admit, it just doesn't work on me. Viktor Frankl, that incredible Jewish psychologist who didn't just survive the concentration camps of World War II, but endured them well, once said, people have enough to live by, but nothing to live for. They have the means, but no meaning. We have the means to buy almost anything that Vanity Fair has to offer. But those things have no meaning. And so we press forward to the celestial city. As Apostle Daniel H. Wells said during the days of Brigham Young, I know of nothing outside of the kingdom of God that is worth having. I pray we can come to see as clearly as Elder Wells did that the world has nothing worth holding on to. That we can press forward all the way to the Smoky Mountains, 
where the cloud of smoke and the pillar of fire will fill the mountain of the Lord. With that in the distance, it is so easy to say no to Pigeon Forge.